Welcome to Brainish English Stories. The big Pullman train was moving fast and smoothly. A couple who had just married got on this train in San Antonio. The man's face was red from many days in the sun and wind. He wore new black clothes, and his hands were red and rough. He kept looking down at his clothes with respect. He looked at the other people on the train quickly and shyly. The bride was not very pretty, and she wasn't very young. She wore a blue dress with some velvet and many steel buttons. She kept turning her head to look at her large sleeves, which were stiff and high. They made her feel uncomfortable. It was clear that she used to cook, and she knew she would cook again as a good wife. She blushed when some people looked at her as she got on the train. Her plain face showed little emotion and looked calm. They were very happy. Have you ever been in a parlor car before? He asked, smiling with joy. No, she said, I never was. It's nice, isn't it? Yes, it's great. Later, we'll go to the dining car and have a big meal. It's the best food ever. Costs one dollar. Oh, does it? The bride said. One dollar. That's too much for us. Right, Jack? Not this time, he said proudly. We're going to enjoy everything this trip. Later, he told her about the train. This train goes 1,000 miles across Texas and only stops four times. He was very proud. He showed her the fancy parts of the train, and her eyes grew wide as she looked at the green velvet seats, the shiny brass, silver, and glass and the dark, polished wood. At one end, there was a bronze figure holding up a wall, and there were pretty designs on the ceiling. To them, the train looked beautiful just like their new life together. The man's face was glowing with happiness, which made him look a bit silly to the black porter. The porter sometimes watched them with an amused smile from far away. Other times, he treated them rudely in small, sneaky ways, but they didn't notice much. They also didn't notice when some of the other passengers looked at them and laughed. We will arrive in yellow sky at 342, he said, looking lovingly into her eyes. Oh, will we? she said as if she didn't know before, showing surprise at what her husband said was her way of being a good wife. She took a small silver watch from her pocket. She looked at it carefully, frowning with concentration. Her husband's face lit up with happiness. I bought it in San Antonio from a friend he said happily. It's seventeen minutes past twelve, she said, looking at him shyly, trying to be playful. A passenger who saw them rolled his eyes and smiled to himself in one of the many mirrors. Finally, they went to the dining car. Two rows of black waiters in bright white suits watched them enter. They were interested but also calm as if they already knew what to expect. The couple was served by a waiter who seemed happy to help them with their meal. He acted like a kind father, smiling warmly. The couple didn't notice that he was a little patronizing. But when they went back to their seats, they both looked like they were happy to be done with the meal. On the left, Far away on a long purple hill was a thin line of mist where the Rio Grande River was flowing. The train was getting closer, 
and yellow sky was where the river and train would meet. As the train came nearer to yellow sky, the husband started to get nervous. His red hands moved more and more. Sometimes, he seemed lost in thought when his wife leaned forward to talk to him. Jack Potter, the man, was beginning to feel the weight of what he had done. He was the town marshal of Yellow Sky, a man people knew, liked, and feared. He was important in his small town. He had gone to San Antonio to meet a woman he loved, and after some prayers, he had convinced her to marry him. He did this without telling anyone in Yellow Sky. Now, he was bringing his new wife back to a town that had no idea what was coming. People in Yellow Sky could marry however they wanted, following the usual customs. But Potter felt that he had done something wrong. He thought that he had betrayed his friends or failed to follow some unspoken rule. He had committed a big crime in his eyes. In San Antonio, he felt free, like a man hidden in the dark. It was easy to forget about his responsibilities there. But now the moment was coming when he had to face yellow sky in the daylight. Potter knew that his marriage was a big deal in his town. The only thing bigger would be the burning of the new hotel. He knew his friends would be shocked. He had thought many times about sending them a telegraph to tell them, but he was too afraid. And now the train was speeding toward a town that would be full of surprise, happiness, and maybe even anger. He looked out the window at the haze coming closer. Yellow Sky had a brass band that played badly but the people loved it. He laughed without feeling happy, thinking about it. If the people knew he was coming with his new wife, they would meet him with the band at the train station. They would cheer and laugh as they walked him and his bride to his home. Jack decided that he would quickly and quietly get from the train station to his house. Once inside, he could tell the people something from a safe distance and stay there until everyone calmed down a bit. The bride looked at him with worry. What's wrong, Jack? He laughed again. I'm not worried, girl. I'm just thinking about yellow sky. She blushed because she understood. They both felt a little guilty and this made them feel even closer to each other. They looked at each other with soft, loving eyes. But Jack still laughed nervously, and the bride's face stayed red. Jack, feeling guilty for surprising the people of Yellow Sky, watched the fast-moving landscape carefully. We're almost there, he said. Soon. The porter came to tell them that they were close to Jack's home. The porter had a brush in his hand and, this time he wasn't acting proud. He brushed Jack's new clothes as Jack slowly turned around for him. Jack awkwardly pulled out a coin and gave it to the porter, copying what he had seen other people do. It was hard for him like a man trying to put shoes on a horse for the first time. The porter took their bag, and as the train slowed down, Jack and his wife moved to the small platform of the car. The two engines and the long line of train cars rushed into Yellow Sky Station. They need to get water here, Jack said in a sad, tight voice like someone talking about a funeral. Before the train stopped, he had already looked down the platform and was happy and surprised to see that no one was there except for the station agent. 
The agent looked a little nervous and hurried as he walked toward the water tanks. When the train stopped, the porter got off first and placed a small step for them to get down. Come on, girl, Jack said in a rough voice. As he helped her off the train, they both laughed, but it sounded fake. Jack took the bag from the porter and told his wife to hold on to his arm. They walked quickly away, and Jack saw that they were unloading the two trunks from the train. He also saw the station agent, far ahead near the baggage car, turning and running toward him, waving his arms. Jack laughed and groaned at the same time, realizing that Yellow Sky was starting to react to his new marriage. He held his wife close and they hurried away. Behind them, the porter stood laughing to himself. The California Express train on the Southron Railway was supposed to arrive in Yellow Sky in 21 minutes. In the weary gentleman's saloon, there were six men at the bar. One was a traveling salesman who talked a lot and very fast. Three were Texans who didn't feel like talking at that moment. The other two were Mexican sheep herders, who usually didn't talk at all when they were in the weary gentleman's saloon. The barkeeper's dog lay on the wooden walkway outside the door. His head rested on his paws, and he looked around sleepily, always watching like a dog that sometimes gets kicked. Across the sandy street were some bright green grass patches, which looked so strange in the hot sand that they seemed fake, like the grass mats used in plays to show a lawn. At the cooler end of the train station, a man without a coat sat in a tilted chair, smoking his pipe. The fresh-cut bank of the Rio Grande River was near the town, and beyond it, there was a large, purple-colored plain full of mesquite trees. Except for the busy salesmen and the men in the saloon, yellow sky was quiet and sleepy. A new person leaned on the bar, telling stories confidently, like a storyteller who had found a new audience. And just when the old man fell down the stairs with the big dresser in his arms, the old woman was coming up with two buckets of coal, and, of course, the traveling salesman's story was interrupted by a young man who suddenly appeared at the open door. He shouted, Scratchy Wilson is drunk, and he's shooting his guns. The two Mexicans quickly put down their drinks and quietly left through the back door of the saloon. The traveling salesman, who didn't understand how serious it was, laughed and said, Okay, so what? Let him. Come on, have a drink with me. But the news made everyone in the room suddenly quiet and serious. The salesman saw that it was important. Everyone had become sad and worried right away. Wait, said the salesman, confused. What's going on? His three friends started to explain, but the young man at the door spoke first. It means, the young man said as he walked into the saloon, that for the next two hours, this town will be dangerous. The barkeeper went to the door and locked it. He also closed the heavy wooden shutters over the windows and locked them. The room became dark, like a church. The traveling salesman looked around at the others. But wait, he said loudly. What's happening? Are you telling me there's going to be a gunfight? We don't know if there will be a fight or not, one man answered seriously. But there will definitely be some shooting, 
The young man who had warned them waved his hand. Oh, there will be a fight for sure if anyone wants it. Anyone can go outside and find a fight. There's a fight waiting in the street. The salesman was torn between being interested and feeling scared for his own safety. What's his name again? he asked. Scratchy Wilson, they all answered at the same time. And will he kill somebody? What are you going to do? Does this happen a lot? Does he go crazy like this once a week or something? Can he break down that door? No, he can't break down the door, said the barkeeper. He's tried three times before. But when he comes, you should lie down on the floor, stranger. He will definitely shoot at the door, and a bullet might come through. After that, the salesman kept a close eye on the door. It wasn't time yet to lie on the floor, but to be safe, he moved closer to the wall. Will he really kill someone? He asked again. The men laughed quietly and in a mocking way at his question. He's out to shoot and he's looking for trouble. It's not smart to mess with him. But what do you do in a situation like this? What do you do? Asked the traveling salesman. A man answered, well, he and Jack Potter. But the other men quickly interrupted him. All saying together, Jack Potter is in San Antonio. Who is Jack Potter? What does he have to do with this? Asked the salesman. Oh, he's the town marshal. When Scratchy gets drunk like this, Jack goes out and fights him. Wow, said the salesman, wiping sweat from his forehead. That's a tough job. The voices in the room had become quiet whispers. The salesman wanted to ask more questions because he was getting more and more worried and confused. But when he tried, the men just looked at him with annoyance and told him to stay quiet. A tense silence filled the room. In the dark shadows, their eyes were glowing as they listened carefully for sounds from the street. One man signaled the barkeeper three times, and the barkeeper, moving like a ghost, handed him a glass and a bottle. The man poured a full glass of whiskey, set the bottle down quietly, and drank the whiskey in one gulp. Then he turned back toward the door completely silent again. The salesman noticed that the barkeeper, without making a sound, had taken out a rifle from under the bar. Later, he saw the barkeeper motioning for him to come closer, so he tiptoed across the room. You better come with me behind the bar, whispered the barkeeper. No, thanks, said the salesman sweating nervously. I'd rather stay near the back door, just in case. But the barkeeper made a firm but friendly gesture, so the salesman followed him. He found himself sitting on a box, with his head just below the level of the bar. Seeing the metal pipes and fittings behind the bar, which reminded him of armor, made him feel a little safer. The barkeeper sat down comfortably on a nearby box. You see, he whispered, the Scratchy Wilson is amazing with a gun, really amazing, and when he's out for trouble, we all hide, of course. He's one of the last guys from the old gang that used to hang out by the river here. When he's drunk, he's dangerous. But when he's sober, he's nice, kind of simple, he wouldn't hurt anyone. He's the nicest guy in town. But when he's drunk, whoa, there were quiet moments of stillness. 
I wish Jack Potter was back from San Antonio, said the barkeeper. He shot Scratchy in the leg once, and he would handle this situation. Suddenly, they heard the sound of a gunshot from far away, followed by three loud, wild yells. The men in the dark saloon immediately felt a weight lift off their shoulders. They shuffled their feet and looked at each other. Here he comes, they said.